and be open. Good morning, everyone. Uh, today is the February 18th meeting of the Elementary School Building Committee. And as in my role as chair, my the first thing I need to do is make sure the members of the committee can see, can hear and be heard. And I'm just gonna call out names as I see them on the screen. Um, and um, I will start with Paul. Present. Sean. Present. Jonathan. Present. Tammy. Present. Rupert. I am present and accounted for. Thank you. That's great. Mike. Present. Ben. Also present. Phoebe. I'm here. Great. And Alicia. Present. Great. So, um, we're a few people will be joining us later and I may just make sure they can be heard as they join. Um, we have a, a quite full agenda this morning and Margaret, maybe you can just pull it up so people can look at it. And then Margaret, um, I'm turning it over to Margaret for some opening comments just to anchor everyone on where we are on the timeline. And um, then a quick review of what we're doing today and looking into the future. So Margaret, um, you're on. Hey, everybody. Um, good morning. Um, I have uh, the agenda for this this morning, and I'm going to actually I'm going to just recap briefly, but I'm going to start with what's at the bottom. <clears throat> so um, trying to give everybody a better uh, sense going forward what we're doing. I sent an email last night, which was an effort to kind of summarize a little bit, kind of ground you for the meeting today. But, you know, in a nutshell, we're in this first initial phase, which is the pre preliminary design program, which is, you know, due diligence on the buildings, um, reviewing and finalizing the ed programming, ed program, beginning a, um, list of the spaces that are required to satisfy the ed program and identifying the options that are going into this first submission. So the meetings that are coming up, so we are meeting again on the 4th and on the 11th. Um, and I won't go into detail, but in, you know, in a nutshell, it's summarized here at the next meeting, we're really going to be looking at the alternatives at the 11th meeting, we're gonna be reviewing final alternatives, which is just to say, which options are we gonna study and uh, probable cost or estimated cost. It's a very high level conceptual cost because obviously there aren't drawings really uh, to look at. That those, those meetings are sandwiched in between other meetings that are going on, two school committee meetings um, and then we have a target date for the submission. So that's kind of the big picture. Once that submission is, we're gonna start this next phase, which is called the per, per, preferred schematic report, which is moving towards the um, preferred alternative. That submission is due to the MSBA in the end of June. So we have about three months to kind of figure out what it is, figure out approximately what it's gonna cost and for you all to make an official vote on it. So this first phase has a lot of interaction with the school committee because it's the school committee's role to look at the program, at the educational program. Um, but it's gonna be, and uh, once we get to the PSR phase, um, we're really gonna be, it's really gonna be fully in the building committee's charge. So there's been a lot going on. Um, I'm not gonna go through the details because I summarized <clears throat> some of the background last night um, in my email, but just to talk to go into a little more detail about we're going what we are going to do today. So uh, Donna's team is going to talk about the preliminary space summary, which is one of the components of this uh, preliminary design program submission. Um, she they have begun to study what those options might look like and want to talk about some of that. Jonathan's going to give us a report on the net zero subcommittee. And if we need to, we can sort of go back and take a look at the priority and criteria matrix. 
Um, so that is kind of the overview. There are a couple of invoices to look at. I sent you all this morning. If you wanna be able to see them on your screen and that is it. So with that, I'm gonna turn this over to Donna. Okay, and I see, and, and Margaret, I see Sean's hand is up. So I'm just, and okay. people don't raise your hands if you wanna jump in. Thanks, Kathy. I just wanted to confirm. So is, is March 4th the first time sort of a professional or, or uh, cost estimate from the designer will be revealed or presented? Yeah, yes. that's correct, okay. Sean. So um, with that, you know, we understand everyone is so anxious to see, see mm -hmm. the costs and they're not really, they're order of magnitude, right? Right now we, like you, what you'll see that we haven't really drawn anything. And, and so, we are engaging our uh, professional uh, cost estimator, A.M. Fogarty, mm -hmm. who is going to take the information that we have, which is pretty much going to be on a square footage cost because we don't have all the detail yet. And um, he's going to take a look at market conditions, any specific or unique criteria pertaining to your project. We don't have the sites fully developed, but, but we know a little bit about the sites. So we'll take some of that into consideration, but yeah. it hasn't fully been vetted. So um, yes, but we have started that conversation with him. And, and even though it's cost per square foot, you know there is a lot of detail that goes into it. So he needs about a week and a half, two weeks to pull together even just an order of magnitude. So. Um, I know some people have been like, well, give us a range of what the cost no, yeah. per square foot is. And no, that sounds great. I'm, I'm patient. I'm not in a rush for it. I just, there's a lot of sort of, <laughs> a lot um, of people are. there's a sort there's a lot of, um, you know, informal estimating going on. And I just want this committee to know and the, the public to know that the, the first time we'll get a sort of professional estimate is, is that meeting. And I think that's what we should be focused on. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we've been working to get a lot of fact finding and that, that I, and maybe that will just, um, I, I can start with that conversation is the last couple of months have been fact finding, understanding the educational program needs, understanding what the town's desires are for net zero and, and other requirements. It's not just about net zero, uh, understanding a little bit more about the site, the traffic, et cetera. So, um, we have to go as deep as how many staff are going to be in this building so we can fully understand how big the parking lot needs to be, right? So I do want to uh, say thank you to a lot of folks that have been working behind the scenes and, and especially Mike Morris and his team because this, this first phase has really <laughs> been heavy lifting on their part. Um, so, so with that said, if we're good, we'll just jump into the ed program. If can, okay. can I just jump in yeah. for one second? Uh, Kathy, do you want to see if Simone can be heard? And be oh, recognized? absolutely. Thanks, Mike. Um, Simone, we just, I just want to make sure you can hear, hear and be heard. So if you just indicate that, it'd be great. I can hear and be heard. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> Thank you. So I Thank think. You. Tim, Tim was, Tim's in charge of the presentation. I have the screen to share. I will do that now. And, you know, I, as people, to the extent they looked at their email late last night, I sent out what were very preliminary slides. So this is, this is the official set. And, and we will be posting these. Right. So uh, go ahead, Tim. So the first process, as everyone has alluded to, um, and, and we've stated before, we're in the preliminary design program phase. And really it's a focus on the educational program, which establishes the educational needs for the school and the district as you combine two schools. And then what that translates to for um, space needs, square footage, um, spatial relationships and adjacencies. And we are gonna continue this conversation. We had a great, uh, last visioning meeting yesterday with staff, but but that's not the end of the conversation. So we'll continue to develop uh, the spatial relationships and adjacencies, which will set the stage for um, how the building really all comes together. 
Go ahead, Tim. And, and again, you know, the educational program is, is, it's not just about this building, but how it is um, this new construction or new school, combined school supports the uh, educational programs district wide. Again, program relationships and adjacencies, which ultimately define the square footage for the project. Next. So we, we, we're gonna, we, we are required um, to look at two enrollment alternatives or options, the 165 students. And today we're not really focusing on that. I, I think everyone, including MSBA will recognize designing a school for 165 students isn't really the right solution for MSBA or, or for the town, but they want that as a cost basis to evaluate moving forward. Our focus will be on combining both the Fort River and Wildwood schools, K-5 with an enrollment of 575. Donna? Yeah. Can you just give a super high level explanation of the 165? Because How we got there? Yes, which yeah. I mean, it was given to us by the MSBA, but. Um... Sure, sure. So originally um, it was a K-6 with 320 students. And what MSBA does is take your entire enrollment, district-wide enrollment, looks at the capacity at all of your schools. So in this instance, if it was just Fort River, they would look at Wildwood, Crocker Farm, and Fort River. Once sixth grade moves to the middle school, MSBA says, logically, um, that creates excess space in both Crocker Farm and Wildwood. So if it's two, I'm not even sure if it's two or three classrooms per grade, and those students move to the middle school, you now have two or three classrooms per school extra. So therefore, you can redistrict and move students around. So to fill those that capacity of both of the other schools, which, and then in turn, reduces the enrollment needs here. So not only do you reduce a full grade uh, from 320, let's just say it's 20 students per grade. So now you would be at 280. You then take some of the students that you would need here and redistrict them to the other two schools. If that, And that's how we came up with that. Um, I know the MSBA did issue a revised enrollment uh, certificate that does need to be approved, signed, and sent back to them. So we have that officially now. Thank you. And I would just want to add for context. So this came up um, at the, there's a kickoff meeting for the process with the MSBA, and they brought this to the table and kind of announced they were doing this. So it was, there were some eyebrows raised, they explained their thinking. But um, since then, we've gone ahead and processed the paperwork based on what they are offering the community. And, and just to add to that, the reason why they modified it was because the school committee has voted to move the sixth grade to the middle school. So I don't wanna say it was our request, but we did ask for that, that a K-6 model doesn't work anymore based on school committee policy. Yeah, it was taking that action and sort of making it logical within their, um, the way they think about it. Right. Okay, so we're gonna focus on the combined 575 K through five. All right, Tim. So at the very beginning of the conversation, we take what the district's class size policies are, and there's a range for the lower grades K through one, two through three, and then four through six. We're, we're keeping sixth grade in there because that's where we are right now, recognizing um, down below that, that we don't include the sixth grade in the, in the um, calculations. So for Fort River, only at 165 students, you take that total enrollment divided by the six grades, and you arrive at an average class number of students in a grade across K through five. You take an, one of the class size policy numbers of number of students in a classroom 
And we took a middle of the road of 19 for the younger grades two and three at 20, and then um, 20 for grades four and five. You take the number of students divided by the number of students per classroom, and you arrive at the total number of classrooms required per grade. So for the Fort River only, you, know, you have 1.42 to 1.35 and 1.4 classrooms per grade. Obviously, you can't do a half size classroom or split the classes like that. So you round up. So for a Fort River only 165 K through five school, you would need two classrooms per grade at a total of 12 classrooms. And then you apply the same principles for the combined Fort River and Wildwood schools. And you'll see taking the same parameters that you really need five classrooms per grade. And I'll no, start. No, no, I, yeah. As soon as you finish, I just want to recognize Allison has joined us and make oh, sure great. she can. Sorry to interrupt. No, that. no, thank you. So um, what you'll see here for the combined school of 575 is the requirement for five classrooms per grade. And, and we've played with the numbers um, as far as class size policy, 21 students, 22, 23, 24. And it really doesn't change the narrative until you get to 24 students um, in the upper grades where perhaps you only need four classrooms per grade. But what that does is you're already at your highest end of your class size policy and should enrollment shifts change and or um, you've got a larger grade or a bubble is what we call it comes through you're going to exceed your class size policy before you even start so we're and everyone is supportive and msba agrees that you want to have the same number of classrooms per grade so this is really only part of the conversation um, you can go to the next tim so I think everyone has the detailed space summary sheet and um, happy to go through it at a point in time if it's appropriate. There's a lot of information in there. And I guess what I would say is the number of general education classrooms is really only part of the story. There's core academic spaces, special ed, and then supporting spaces, art, music, PE, et cetera, all listed in the left-hand column. What we did, this is what was presented to school committee on February 8th. And so we've been working diligently behind the scenes to see how we can reduce the gross square footage and we'll be doing that. Um, go ahead, Paul. So can you just comment on where it differs? I'm just looking at the um, Fort River Wildwood combination, where it differs between MSBA guidelines and um, what is provided here. Um, just there are a couple things that just sort of explain why that's different. Yep, please. absolutely. So the MSBA guidelines are, are, are not complete. And MSBA intentionally uh, leaves room for filling in their guidelines once they understand what each individual district's needs are. Uh, for example, um, they want to see that you do need five classrooms per grade. Right now, they're showing, I think it's 26 classrooms in total, not 30 classrooms. That's one deviation. They are informing us that we need an STE classroom, but yet they don't factor that in to their total gross square footage under core academic. They don't recognize ELL or some of the title resource, title one resources required to support your program. And they don't do it, you know, maliciously or, or malintended. They do it because they, they want to see what your education, each district's educational program is, and then they'll modify it or accept your ed program and accept the square footage for each, uh, for each category or program space. I'm, I'm going to pause. I see Phoebe's got her hand up, and it's easier to have the conversation now. Phoebe, go ahead. Um, so I think that we have gotten uh, some feedback, uh, primarily by email, um, about the 
need or the request to really go through all of the square footage numbers. Um, so I, I think it's important for us as a committee to be able to do that. So if we can build that in somewhere, I think that that's um, going to be something that is going to be key. And I think that a lot of the questions that have surrounded cost have to also do with um, you know, if, if we can go through the square footage uh, needs, wants, all of that, then I think that alleviates some of the cost questions that, that we've also gotten. Um, I, I think that there's some confusion about exactly what the need is for square footage. Um, and so, you know, Donna, you said that we can go through that if uh, at some point, if it's needed. I, I think it is needed. Um, and I think that if we can figure out a way to um, make sure that everybody understands, you know, where are our absolute must haves versus our, you know, what our needs are versus what our wants are and all that kind of stuff. I think that it's easier to kind of um, get everybody on the same page. So I don't know that now's the time to do that, but I think it is something that is hugely important and is going to be needed as we look towards you know, bringing this out to the community and explaining how much of the cost as it relates to the square footage is going to be picked up um, by us first, the MSBA. Right. Uh, so, so thank you, Phoebe. And, and I, I really wasn't 100% clear when I started. This was the educational program needs or square foot program spaces that we brought forward to the school committee on February 8th. Since then, we've had numerous, numerous conversations about how we can reduce the overall program area, which translates to the gross square footage. So we have another meeting with school committee on Tuesday night. And if anyone wants to hear those conversations, I, I think that would be really helpful for a lot of you to see the thought and the conversations that go behind all of these program needs. But this is not the final number and and we're going we're continuing to work to see how we can best achieve the educational program and the most efficient square footage mike i said mike's hand is up yep um i see allison's hands up so i'll, I'll defer to allison I, I i won't lose my comment okay allison yeah i just want to emphasize um because I have been seeing some of the uh, conversations that have been going around in terms of uh, the square footage. And um, I, I, I understand the want versus need, but I also want us to understand that um, when, when people are saying what they need and then it's described as a want, I don't know if that's actually fair to our children. So we have a very complex, uh, student profile that needs to be met by these spaces. Um, I think that if we are going to do this well, I'd like us to highlight where the student needs come in, because if we start saying, well, we'll just combine this, you know, these kids can work together. Well, no, the, the reasons why things are being described the way they are is because there is a need. It's not what is an ideal request. So I just want us to honor some of the things that have been requested in, in understanding that um, we, we, people have been functioning under uh, combining and making compromises and seeing the outcomes of that when you see things don't go as well as you know they could go if you saw children able to have the spaces that they actually need. So I just wanna emphasize that there's a reason why things are being described the way uh, they are and it's not because there's a, people have an abundance of of wish list items that they're trying to. So I just want to make sure that's said. Thank you. Thank you, Allison. Mike? Thanks. Um, I'll be brief. Um, uh, I'll try to be brief. Not easy for me on this topic. So uh, I think there will be, a, as, as Donna said, there'll be a school committee meeting on Tuesday. Uh, we'll be presenting um, a, a some reductions in square footage based on the feedback we've received. Um, and we'll be, we'll, I think we'll be getting to a draft that's below what the town estimated uh, when it was looking at square footage compared to, to other projects. I don't know how the school committee will respond to that. I'm not gonna put Ben on the spot. He's, he's here in a, as one member. Uh, and that'll, all those will be on our website later today, you know, for our meeting on Tuesday. 
But I also think when we think about cost, there are many, many cost drivers that aren't about square footage. And I think sometimes we're, um, the conversation gets a bit myopic uh, on that. Um, the reality is, and I'll make more comments to this uh, on Tuesday, that there's many, many factors that affect the overall cost, some of which the school committee has in terms of the educational program, as Allison indicated, some of which this committee has in terms of uh, building site, construction model, and some of which lie with the town and the town council. Uh, I'm not going to get into details on that again. I'll, I'll speak to that on Tuesday. So I think the conversation about costs is obviously really important. And from my end, I want to do what the educational right thing to do is understanding the cost conscious nature of we have a lot of projects going on in the town. Uh, but the core driver of it in, in terms of square footage is that the cost escalation on building projects everywhere has gone up immeasurably or not immeasurably. It's able to be measured. It's a lot in the last couple of years. And so I think that's something that we can't control, right? We can't, oh, well, if we get this this contractor, it'll magically be $350 per square foot. It's not gonna happen. So I think that's one of the challenges that I think um, is not about pitting sides against sides. It's just the reality is this project's gonna be a lot more expensive than if it was 10, 15 years ago, or even three years ago. That's no one's fault. It, it, it just is what it is. And I think that's the challenges we're faced with. So I'll be bringing uh, with, with Donna and the team to Tuesday, uh, some reductions in square footage um, for the school community to consider, I can't project, pretend how uh, or project how they'll respond to that. We'll lose a lot of flexibility in the building. Uh, I do have some concerns. You know, you think about Crocker Farm Preschool was built in the last 20 years. It was built with four classrooms. It was a belief around inclusion. So all the pullout spaces are incredibly tiny. And when we think about Crocker Farm being overcrowded, it's not because of the K to six population. It's because the preschool rightfully has needed to usurp many more spaces than it had when that building was designed. Um, Educational philosophies change, and it's a 50 year, you know, at least a 50 year building. So it's a really complex set of factors. Phoebe, I'm really glad you raised this topic because I think it, it is something that's getting a lot of uh, interest. But I do think there's a broader set of, of, of conversations that need to happen, some here, some with the school committee, and some with the town council on how to approach having this project be the best project, would be conscious of the cost and the town's ability to, to, to pay for it. And so I think the other thing Phoebe mentioned that I want to make sure gets answered is. The point about MSBA, and if we go over MSBA guidelines, does that mean MSBA doesn't reimburse? And I think that's a really that's a question I'm getting a lot too, Phoebe. So I'm really glad you raised it. I see your hands up, so I don't want to take more time. But I wonder if if Margaret or Donna could could address if there are square footage that does go over the guidelines, does that mean automatically it's not reimbursable? Right. I I, yeah, I hadn't finished my slides so that's okay but no it's it's helpful and maybe may, Phoebe go ahead go ahead and then and then I'll wrap up the slide yeah yeah I was just gonna say um thank you for you know doing that after I speak I was just just wanted to also sort of quantify what I said what I what I said and then heard back in that I don't think anybody is questioning um what our children need. I wanna be very clear about that. I mean, I have three kids. I, I would never question what my children need. Um, and I wouldn't expect anybody else to either. I also, my husband and I own a construction company. So I get those costs as well. Um, I, what is important to me is that as a committee, as a school building committee, as a school committee, as town counselors or whoever else has to be involved in all of these things, that we are individually and as a group abundantly clear on what the needs are and where those things are going, where and how they're going to be implemented. Because as we've seen before in this town, if we're not abundantly clear on those things, we are not, I mean, I think everybody feels like, yes, we need a new school, but we have to get to a point where everybody whether they have children or not, is on board with this. Um, and that, regardless of whether we think it should be, that a big piece of that is going to be expense. Um, so we have to be very clear so that when we do get community members asking us about this, we, each of us individually and together, can say without any question, 
here are the needs of our kids, here are the needs of our staff, our teachers, our administration, everybody, and here is why it needs to be this way. Um, because if we can't do that with all of the reasoning behind it, we have an uphill battle from the start. So we just need to be, all of these conversations have to be happening out in the open. Um, and every single one of us has to be very clear on this because otherwise we're gonna be in trouble again. Um, and so that's really more of what we need to get to. Thanks. Sure, and, and thank you, Phoebe. And, and I, again, this is an ongoing dialogue we're having with the school committee. The school committee is the body that needs to, per MSBA um, guidelines, is the body that needs to approve the educational program, which drives the um, program needs translated into square footage, right? So, so every body within the town has, I don't want to say different responsibilities, but uh, the school committee needs to approve the educational program and say, yes, this, this reflects our um, policies, right? Um, so let me just quickly go through, I'll highlight some of the differences. And again, as I started, MSBA's guidelines, the column, that, that large matrix that was sent out, that this is just taking the total square footage or the total net floor area of each of the categories of that very large spreadsheet. With that said, if you look at the column that says MSBA guidelines, you will see it's incomplete. And it's intentionally incomplete because every district's needs are different. And that's why they won't weigh in on your ELL needs. They won't weigh in on your Title I resource, whether it's a literacy specialist, math specialist, um, any of those needs. So MSBA sits back, they say, fill out the sheet on your side of the column. We'll look at your educational program. We'll agree or have comments as to why do you need so much space that doesn't align with your educational program. But if you have programs currently in the district and you have staffs to support these programs, in the core academic and special education categories, then they will support your educational program. They will participate at their reimbursement level for all of those spaces. So the other thing is under special ed, MSBA just puts a formula in there based on the number of students recognizing that every district or every building is different. And so they won't even really weigh in on the special ed spaces that are required. That's the Department of Education, Department of Ed or DESE, um, Elementary and Secondary Education. And they actually weigh in on the special education requirements. They want to ensure that these students have the same access and equal spaces as the gen ed students. So that's why you're gonna see such a divergent difference between the column that says Fort River Wildwood schools at MSBA standards versus MSBA guidelines. Kathy. Um, Donna, so I just, um, Donna has explained this to me once before. So I wanna feed back to you what I think you just said that once MSBA and DESE look at this, they will be scrutinizing these. And to the extent they feel that any of these are too high, they're gonna be coming back to us asking for a rationale on it. And does that mean, or has that ever meant that numbers change in that review process? They could change. Thank you, Kathy. Um, they, could, they could change. At in our experience with MSBA, they'll ask for clarifying questions. Uh, they'll have clarifying questions that are responded to. And we've never included space needs or, or square footage in the core academic and special ed that MSBA has not supported. Um, there are districts that 
will say that they want a gym larger than 6,000 square feet. And MSBA says, well, we're only going 6,000. So the extra 300 there is for storage and for the PE teacher. So, so when you see the categories, these numbers are all rolled up for the individual space needs within each category. But MSBA says you need a 6,000 square foot gym to at elementary school level. And some districts say, well, we don't have a community gym. So we want to make it 12,000 square feet. And MSBA says, okay, but we're not participating in the other 6,000 feet. Yeah, and Donna, can I just add, they don't say you need, they say a guideline for a school of this size is. Well, from an educational perspective, they will tell you that you at 575 students, you can adequately support your PE, your phys ed um, program, having two sections occurring simultaneously, and that's 6,000 square feet. I mean, there's really some rationale behind it. Um, and that's why they wanna see your educational program as well. One, to make sure that you have the staff to support it because they're not going to build something that you can't support. Um, this all actually came out of something that occurred at the very beginning of MSBA's existence is a district went and built this beautiful large building and they couldn't open it because they didn't have the resources to staff it. So MSBA wants to make sure that, that A, it's a program that you need and that it can be supported operationally and you have staff, staff to support it. So the two categories that they will work with the district on is core academic and special education. In our experience, we've never had core academic or special ed not be supported and reimbursed by MSBA. So if, if we could just quickly go through some of the other ones, MSBA will say based on 575 students, you know, you adequately could, you know, need two art rooms and two music rooms. And they recognize that. Right now, just as our first pass on the square footage needs or the program needs, um, the school department has said, you know what, we only need one art room and we're going to utilize the STEM room to support the overflow that is that may or may not occur in the art room. Scheduling is a really big component in all of this. Um, the health and PE, again, we're not exceeding MSBA guidelines. The media center, not exceeding their guidelines. The dining, you can actually see we've reduced the square footage a little bit or the net floor area. Why? Because MSBA says you can have up to two seatings of lunch per day. 575 students, that's a lot of kids to put in the cafeteria with only two sessions, two lunch seatings per day. I don't know anyone, any, any school that would do that. And, and so again, school department said, now we have three seatings per day. We want the space to be large enough that we could have an all school assembly, butts on the floor, and that we can gather the school in the cafetorium. There'll be a stage there. But we don't need the excess space because we'll never have two seatings of, of lunch throughout for the school. That's why those numbers are different. Uh, medical and admin spaces, we're not exceeding custodial maintenance. We're going along with, we know that um, there's never enough storage or um, maintenance spaces throughout the project. But but we maintain and stay within those guidelines. And then the other thing, excuse me, the other thing um, that comes up is you end up with your subtotal program area. So you'll see for Fort River, based on the educational program and the space needs, you have 75,843 net floor area, which is, is the spaces inside the building. There's a grossing factor. So what that is, is all of your quarters, your bathrooms, your non-program spaces, your boiler, your, I shouldn't say boiler, sorry, your mechanical spaces, all of the spaces that are required for 
circulation, toilets, operation of the building. That now has to be factored in as you figure out how big the overall building it is. MSBA up to 1.5 grossing factors. So you take the 75,843 net floor area, you multiply that by 1.5, and that's how we arrive at the gross square footage of the building. Um, Donna, yeah. if I could just add, it's also wall thicknesses, which True. is not uh, insignificant. So, you know, and as we think about uh, thermal insulation, et cetera, and the walls get thicker, right? That's, that's part of your grossing factor. I mean, it's, it's everything. It's, it's what it takes to provide a, a physical space. Um, so we're at about 113, 765. This is our first pass. Again, we'll be going back to school committee on Tuesday night with some modifications to that and how, how creative the school department has gotten to still deliver the same services in a little bit less space. The MSBA guidelines, again, if you look at their spreadsheet, you'll see that they for whatever the formula is, doesn't necessarily work depending on the number of students, but they were saying that, you know, you only need 85,000 square feet of space, but that's based upon just the guidelines up above. That's not taking into consideration your specific needs. However, MSBA also goes on to say, don't listen to the grossing factor that's on the spreadsheet will support up to 1.5 grossing factor. And that is really the lowest that we can really go. Again, recognizing everything as Rick even pointed out, the, the thickness of the walls. Um, our goal is always to get it to 1.4999 um, and come in shy of that, but uh, it's extremely difficult as you build in all the circulation, the services, it has to be completely accessible, right? The quarters need to be so wide. It's extremely challenging to arrive at a gross square footage less than 1.5. Rupert. Rupert, Rupert you, you can call on him, Donna, great. Thank you. Hi, um, th thank you for this. This is very helpful. Um, I'm curious, my understanding is that the MSBA is expecting this to be a 50 year building and that they require us to build in uh, future capacity. How does that figure into this whole process? Thank you. Good question. And, and that is one of the responses that we'll have. Uh, I'm not sure if it's at PSR or, or at schematic design, but they are gonna ask where your future expansion can occur. You can look at it two ways, Rupert, three ways maybe. Um, the first one is you see that we calculated five classrooms per grade and we have utilized a lower class size, um, part of the, the lower number of the class size policy, right? So if I'm just going to pick on fourth and fifth graders, if they're saying it's 20 to 24 students per, per classroom, if you increase that, to 23, 24, you're still within MSBA guidelines, right? So let's just say that's four students per classroom at five classrooms per grade times six grades. You know, there's, there's some expansion opportunities without necessarily impacting the needs of the other core aspects of the building. You can still provide the, the programs for art, PE, lunch, all of those within the overall square footage of your current space. The other consideration will be um, strategically as we think about where we're putting this building or expanding the current building, where future expansion can be, right? Um, there have been some districts that have said, we know we are going to expand probably down the road. So we're consciously, going to ask you to design the cafeteria a little bit larger now so your core spaces can accommodate future growth. And, and we recognize that MSBA might not participate in that. 
but we know down the road in 10, 15 years, we're going to need another classroom per grade or, or whatever it is, right? So we will strategically say or demonstrate where an expansion can occur. And that's something to consider. The other consideration is as a consolidation, you still have the Crocker Farm. So we would also say, okay, well, if you do have expansion, what are the opportunities at Crocker Farm? Phoebe. I just trying to get clear still. Um, so this goes to, this information goes to the school committee next week. When did the details, um, you sent us the, Sorry, I'm just trying to, the revised space summary. And, and that's what we ultimately, uh, our committee votes on, if I'm correct. Uh, okay, yes, I'm so, correct. Uh, no, so, so school committee school votes. Committee on the that. school committee votes on the educational program and the space needs. Um, the, space. the school building committee's charter really, and Margaret, feel free to chime in, is your responsibility is to ensure that the school committee's vote, um, that, that we don't exceed um, the gross square foot guidelines per MSBA, the 1.5. You take the program, you make sure that it's built in the most cost-effective and um, contextually appropriate siting of, of the final solution. But, but it's not the school building committee's charge to say we, we want to reduce the gross square footage of the building. That, that, that's not the school committee's charge. You vote to accept the preliminary design program, and, but you don't say we want the building to be 110,000 square feet. And, and that partnership is intentional, which is, as you can imagine, it's to ensure that the what's driving the project is the educational, is education, right? So it, it's, a, it's an intentionally introduced division of responsibility. So, but Phoebe, you will, um, within the charge of the school building committee, right? Select a renovation addition or new construction or what, what site, um, what you feel is the most cost-effective solution working again in tandem with other partners such as the net zero folks and, and other charters or um, desires or bylaws of the town. So once, once that's why we needed this, the educational program first is to make sure we're building a school. We're not, we're not building a rec center. We're not building, right? We're building a school and MSBA wants to make sure that the building supports your educational program. So that's why, it, you know, it really is a logical, it's a logical process that you start with the educational program that will inform the size of your space needs and that will inform the overall size of the building. The configuration of it, there is a little bit of play there. We wanna work with the school department to make sure that we have the correct spatial relationships and adjacencies but you know the building committee will be involved in the overall you know massing of the building and how that will all play out so so as margaret said there is overlap but the first part is making sure that we have the educational program that that school committee kathy sorry i don't think okay, no, 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 so so mike said earlier that he later on today, I think, will be the materials that are going to the school committee. I will pay attention to it. And it's not, a, it hasn't been always easy for me to find where those materials are, but I think I've figured out how to find them. And if everyone in this committee will like, I'll just send the link to those materials because that'll have both the written educational plan and uh, to the extent there are choices being given on space, um, that'll be in that. And so, and that meeting is Tuesday night at 6.30. Am I correct, Mike? So I just thought if you wanna see, you know, the, that, that first round that we had in our packets, this is what they saw last time. So if everyone wants to follow it, um, I'll just make sure you know how to get the materials. Um,
So I know we have some other fun stuff to talk about. Are, are, do we have any more? And this is so important. So I, I want to make sure that everyone is comfortable with the, it's really at this point, the process where we are with it, we're working to refine and reduce the overall program space needs, as well as, as the overall square footage of the building. And again, it's an iterative process. We'll go before school committee on the 22nd next Tuesday, and then we will be asking them for final approval on February 9th, 8th, 8th, maybe? 8th. March 8th? March, oh, sorry, February, God, no, we can't go back in time, can we? Um, March 8th, sorry. Uh, so, so they too are not going to give us a definitive at, that, at, at next week's, but we will be utilizing, based on the feedback we hear, um, we need a square footage, rough order of magnitude, to give to our cost estimator to present to you with an option. So um, we are gonna have to, you know, plus or minus a thousand square feet, we have to feed the cost estimator the number, but the final vote will occur um, March 8th. I'm looking, um, I made my screen bigger. I don't see any other hands up, Donna, so I think we can move yeah. on. Perfect, okay. thank Great. you. Okay, so Tim. So we'll start talking about how the educational program informs the space needs, spatial relationships, adjacencies, and the overall uh, layout of the school. And what this might demonstrate to you is what, what you see in light purple and dark purple are your core academic and special education needs. And you can see that and of course with the numbers, but visually this supports that you are truly designing a building to support your educational program. There, there is not excess space within and you can see how this core academic and special ed really are, are the focus of the building. So these are based on um, the space summary that you just saw and they will be refined after we have um, input from the school committee on Tuesday night. But right now, this is showing the overall proportions of all the different space needs for each of the categories. And we started the conversation yesterday, which is pretty exciting with the uh, faculty on what, what, are, what are your desires for organization of the building and your spatial relationships? And how do you wanna function as a grade? And how do you want to teach vertic you know, your vertical and horizontal collaboration? What, how might that help shape the look and feel of a building? Um, then we also want to talk about how we can make this a community resource. So the gym, the cafetorium, your um, library or media center may also be a community resource. So we also want to make sure that we design this in a sensitive way so that your core academic spaces can be closed off while the, um, the community at large can utilize the building. So you can see how this is going to start to help form the shape of the building. And if you go to the next slide. Now you'll start seeing how with the push and pull and the information we receive, how this may start to inform the shape of the building. Having your core academic spaces um, that can be um, locked off from the community program spaces and how this may start to inform the size, the shape, the layout of the building. What we're showing at the very bottom, I don't know if Tim's cursor can go along here, oh, I guess not, um, is that these, what we're showing down below are your kindergarten spaces. You can see they're slightly larger. And then grades one through five, the size of the spaces are all the same, both for flexibility, you can move your grades around, it, it doesn't matter, you can have kindergarten and third grade, you know, on one floor or, or however you want to manage it, but you'll see how what we're our goal is to make sure that we have the integrated special ed programs integrated 
into your core academic spaces. And then ideally, we want to try to make the building as efficient as possible because we have to stay within our 1.5 grossing factor. So we can all safely say that a one-story option isn't a consideration. Um, and we're looking at both a two-story school and a three-story school. And we'll, we'll, we have a couple of slides to talk to that now. And you'll see how the number of stories will impact the site as, as we look forward. But maybe I'll just pause and see if anyone has any comments on, about how, you know, this is the thought process um, how we actually start arriving at laying out a building. Everyone wants to see options. Okay, Tim, you, you, <laughs> it's all you. As Donna said, uh, one of the obvious like, largest factors of how much of the site is occupied by the different options is the shape of the building. You know, so as we go through with everyone and, and determine whether it's two or three stories, that'll be a significant factor, but there are just other significant factors that we want to touch on as we go through these slides. Um, we have a better understanding of your parking needs now. So um, what we're going to show is a little bit bigger than we have shown on past iterations of site plans. Um, we've gotten initial feedback and we expect to report next week from our traffic engineer on how things are flowing. So we have a better understanding moving forward. Um, We've had initial discussions with our engineers about stormwater management on both sites and how we're going to handle that. And the amount of space that we end up paving or putting a building on has an impact. So it all, again, ties back to whether it's a two or three story new or renovated building. And then we also need to talk about the program for the outside of the building. We know that there's an emphasis on outdoor learning and it's gonna be a big part of this site, wherever it is. But you know the specifics of it, how much space that's gonna take up, how far it's gonna be from the building where it's located on the site, uh, we have to discuss and work around. And then community use of the sites for fields, um, whether they're gonna be replaced in kind at Fort River or adjusted, these are all things that we have to consider as we move things around on the site. And then of course, um, there's considerations of how we're going to meet the town's um, energy goals. Um, the geothermal field that's used is gonna take up some space as will an array of photovoltaic panels. Um, here's an iteration of Wildwood uh, that pushes along what you saw last time we met. The parking has been increased to about 170 spaces to better suit the staff that will be in the building. Uh, this particular option shows a two-story building. Um, while it is a two-story building, the program is typically not divided evenly between the first and the second floor, just because there are things that are two-story spaces and there are things that are going to exist on the first floor, like a lobby that make the first floor a little bit larger. And the, if the classrooms for the kindergarten are larger, things don't always stack. So if you do have a 113,000 square foot program, your footprint is typically going to be a little bit more than half of that for two stories. So that's what this is showing. So we still have, um, with the updated information, room on Wildwood to accommodate all of the things we need to. Um, the flexibility to use the fields at the middle school for geothermal um, will make things easier, but it's certainly possible to accommodate it on site. Um, this is showing a little bit longer queuing around traffic for drop-off. Um, our initial existing conditions report from our traffic engineer um, is going to reflect that is most that of the queuing now happens on site, which is great for movement. But when with an addition of 225 students, obviously that is going to change. So, um, you know, we need to account for that in the design going forward. And can you just talk about the hot, is it the Hawthorne site? Because I know sure. that's been brought up. The Hawthorne site 
has been mentioned and we are looking at it and looking to get a little more information on it that is to the southwest of the site um it was mentioned as a site for elements of our you know energy goals possibly geothermal or solar it is a little bit far away from the building for it to be efficiently used for geothermal um and whether or not it's the highest and best use of that site to put solar on it remains to be seen um that being said some part of the outdoor program of the school might be possible but it is across the access drive to the head start um Obviously, the fields at the middle school are closer, but we will continue to look at all of these things in the whole. Um, this is a three-story footprint on the Wildwood site, um, 15, 10,000 square feet smaller than the two-story uh, footprint. All of that space then gets turned back to the site for use, more circulation, more outdoor play, more outdoor learning, um, make stormwater management a little bit easier um, and changes your perception of the site. Uh, Sean, you have your hand up. Just um, when we look at all the options in the future, is there a significant cost difference when we're talking about how many stories? Or, or three story, um, or is it more efficient to do three stories versus two stories? So there are multiple factors that are, um, in terms of cost, that are driven by the footprint of the building. So starting with Fort River, um, the soil conditions are such that a three story building would have higher loads on foundations. And that might be the um, threshold, if you will, for going to either um, the more specialized deeper foundation system or some sort of requirement to improve the soils, be it ram depth or piers or something. The short answer is there could be costs associated with a taller building on um, the soils that we have at Fort River. Um, there's also the question of stormwater management. Both of these buildings, once you reduce the existing building or take it off the site, the amount of impervious area is lower than the existing state. And so if, so this is a redevelopment. And then if you were to increase the impervious area on site, your, the onus for dealing with stormwater increases. So you have to contain more of a, of a storm event. Um, so there's costs associated with, um, so, you know, as we go forward and evaluate up, the options, we'll have to think about all of those factors and, and that'll be built into the budgets that we see for the options. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And then Tim, I think there's also considerations for energy use, um, right? There's there's less envelope, there's gonna be less insulate. There's other factors that will play out when you look at a two-story versus a three-story option that do have cost and other project goals as we look at it. Uh, jo Jonathan has his hand up too. I, I was going to make basically the same point that, that Donna just did that that from a you know achieving that zero perspective, um, there are differences that will impact cost between a, a one story and particularly a three story scheme with a two story scheme in between. Certainly. I mean Capital costs, operating costs will all be affected. And then, um, you know, just as we're talking about fitting things on the site, um, some of the elements that, you know, help you achieve those net zero goals take up a lot of space. Uh, you know, you won't see the geothermal field in the end, but it, it does take up a lot of space. Same with solar, which you will obviously see. So, um, Tim, I have a question on geothermal as you're learning more about our sites. Um, at this preliminary stage, do you look at geothermal or a hybrid, or do you go with one and then as you start to learn more? So if, you know, the go, no go, because I, I know you've done some schools, or at least I think, where not everything is geothermal. So that, um, I'll stop there. You know, so would you go with one design or do you go with, or you could do this kind of design? 
So we will start with understanding what it would take to do the complete geothermal field that would, would handle the entire load of all heating and cooling scenarios. And then there's a consideration of how much space you have. There's a consideration of money. I mean, the reason to go to a partially air source system um, is that it will save you first costs. Um, and so once we understand you know, the, the full build out, that'll allow us to start to evaluate how much of a hybrid would be appropriate to either manage first costs or to get the most efficient system. And then as you push those levers up and down in terms of a hybrid, some of the other costs associated, namely solar, are also going to change to uh, accommodate the less efficient system from geothermal to an air source VRF. So, so um, we are working um, to provide models, or I say models, not physical models, um, models to demonstrate what the differences are and and how many. Um, geothermal wells we need, you know, this whole thing is an iterative process because we still don't have the gross square footage of the building. Uh, we now know what the school operations are and anticipated community use needs are, right? We know the building isn't going to shut down at 4 p.m. There's, uh, you know, needs for evening and weekend use as well as summer use for summer programs. So. All of these are going to help inform how much energy is required to truly um, run the building or run the school, which will then help inform us on how many geothermal wells you need, um, taking into consideration the unique aspects of each site and understanding what can be generated on each site. So the quantity of the wells that would be required to support the energy use for the building. And then we'll also look at, again, as Tim said, is there kind of a diminishing return on the geothermal wells where maybe we don't provide an, all of the geothermal to support the peak load of the building but perhaps what is the most typical use of the building. And then the air source could supplement that for the peak times. And maybe there's a diminishing return in cost on that. So that, that's what we're weighing now that we'll be having that conversation with the net zero folks as well. Paul. Um, so when you are looking at siting the building, do you site the building and then say, now where can we put the geothermal? Or do you say, look at it as a whole saying, oh, we, we should move the building so we can fit more geothermal in. I mean, geothermal is not a done deal, obviously. It's just one option and it's a cost component to that as well. So I'm just curious how you um, go about um, doing the site plan. Um, well, we have to look at a lot of things in concert. I mean. First consideration would be how we can put things in space with the existing building operating. Mm -hmm. So um, it's take, for example, the geothermal field that's on the Wildwood site, half of it is in the parking lot of the existing building. So that introduces uh, a phasing complication. Um, you know, things would have to be shut down and halfway through the field, uh, the operation of the existing school parking lot would have to change. Um, Or, I mean, we'll, we'll also consider options where you could put the new building in place of the demolished wildwood building, but that introduces the need for swing space to the equation. So, I mean, sort of a, a roundabout answer, but we have to look at all of those things so, at the so same time. Yeah. So your first cut, let's keep the building, let's not build it on the same footprint as the existing building that because mm -hmm. that eliminates a major headache for us. So let's try and cite it so we can keep the building operational. And then you start to work from there. Yep. And if that works, that that's the best case scenario. Yeah. And I, I just, yeah, I just add, um, it's, a, it's a big cost consideration because it shortens the overall construction period. So 
Jonathan? Mar Margaret said exactly what I was going to say, that, that, you know, as this is a holistic thing that they have to kind of grab onto. Um, and, you know, one of the drivers for cost uh, beyond, you know, how much does a, a, you know, a square foot of roofing cost these days is how long does the project take? And, and that, that siting and that phasing greatly impacts cost. And, and just to add to that, it's our understanding there is no available swing space in town to relocate either Wildwood or Fort River schools. So we would then need to provide temporary housing for the students uh, while we demolish the building and build new, right? So the kids still need to go to school, I think. And people would say, we're not going to go remote for the two years that it takes yeah. to build no, the I understand. building. Yeah, I understand. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. No, I, I, no, I'm, yeah. Just trying to, I'm just trying to understand your hierarchy of decision making. That's all I want to know. Yeah, thanks. It, Thank you. you know, and, and you'll see the multiple iterations um, and, and your input is it's, it, incredibly important. And as all of the information becomes available to us, the design is going to shift. A, an important consideration, for example, is how are we going to effectively or the best that we can move the cars onto the site so it doesn't impact the traffic on the road, right? So circulation is really important as well. And, and of course, we always start with the orientation of the building. So um, your input and observations will be instrumental as we start looking at all of the different ideas. And, and also, I, um, we haven't fully explored if building the building into the hill as, again, so it's, it's really helpful to have different eyes looking at this. We haven't fully explored what that impact would be if we could take advantage of building the building into the, into the hill. For example, uh, yeah. Just I would like to say that you know these footprints are based on diagrams that we know that work on your understanding of your program, but we haven't really talked about adjacencies. We haven't talked about entrances and entrances. All of the things that could completely change the shape of this footprint, and and we are essentially getting to understand all of the variables, the size of the things we knew. That, that we need to make the decisions moving forward and seeing what can work and what cannot. And then as we, you know, paint the site in broad brush strokes, we'll be able to focus in on, um, you know, options that you can really evaluate with a fine tooth comb moving forward. Um, shifting over to Fort River, here's a two story building with a footprint larger than you've seen before. Um, the same factors exist with additional layers of um, setbacks from your uh, riverfront and wetlands. Um, this has only a few more parking spaces than currently exist on the Fort River site now. Uh, so there's very little chance if we go with a new building that we will exceed um, the current uh, perme impermeable area. So that's a good thing. Um, while the groundwater is high at Fort River, um, there is enough area, you know, based on initial conversations with our uh, civil engineers to deal with stormwater management. And, you know, one of the good things is that those systems while on the surface can be shallow and sponsor outdoor learning. They can also be in some of the setbacks that we are avoiding for the building themselves. So, um, you know, we've talked a great deal about the limitations on the site, but, um, you know, some of the things that we have to deal with in terms of making the building work and making the site work can be in those areas. So that's a good thing. Um, and that, so there's a lot of flexibility there. I mean, as we move forward, we'll Look at this site in a lot of different ways. You know, some of the parking shown here is a little far from the building. Um, we can move that to the north side of the building to get it closer. Um, and as we fully understand the community use of the fields, we may uh, change or move what we show for baseball and softball. Those are simply replicating what is there in kind, but um, have a 
discussion with the district or parks and rec to better understand what actually has to happen. This site plan will certainly evolve. And then without changing any other factors, this diagram shows you the difference between a three and two story building on site. Uh, Kathy. Um, earlier, when Sean asked you about three versus two and cost, you said when you come to the Fort River site, the ground itself is a, um, a consideration. So um, I'll just give you my reference point when I was uh, undergraduate at a neighboring college, uh, UMass built its big dorms um, and they started to sink because people hadn't worried about what was underneath them. So is part of what you were saying is that you have to do more work under the building if you're at the Fort River site. So if, if just say a little bit more about that, whether it's water or the, the soil composition. It is the soil composition. So the Fort River site is in a river valley. So the, the, the soils are clays and other soils that are spongy and don't have the bearing capacity of either rock or other types of soil. Um, Fort River is fill to the south, which might have to be replaced, but most of it is glacial till according to the geotech reports, which is um, permeable for water and very has high bearing capacity. Um, so the it's not necessarily the water, but the composition of the soils at Fort River that might change caught, uh, inform the effect, inform the cost of the foundations. That's not to say that the water doesn't introduce its own set of issues, but it, in terms of the foundations, it's the composition of the soils. Uh, Jonathan? I mean, a little, oops, just to chime in a little bit more on that. And mm -hmm. the, while there may be increased cost, the difference between building a three-story building on that site versus a two-story building on that site versus a you know, a, a 20 story dormitory, you know, th th they aren't necessarily um, as significant um, as if you were building a, a multi, many multi story build, but it is cost. Okay. And can, can I just follow up either Jonathan or Tim on, Tim, you said the water matters. So again, is it, do you have to do more at the foundation? the foundation level or the under the foundation level on this site than you would have to do on, uh, and I, I know I'm getting a little bit into the weeds here, but just your initial thoughts that you do on a Wildwood site. So on, on either site, we would have a, a vapor barrier under the building that would prevent water. It, it is possible if we're doing a new building on this site, we may raise it a little bit just to get it out of the water. And there is some costs associated there, but whether it's a renovation addition or a new building, there are things that we could do that would essentially make the um, building water and vapor permeable from below. Thank you. And then dealing with water on site, um, another cost associated with storm water management, because the water level is high, we wouldn't be dealing with anything underground. So it's a, it's a different type of system. So on the Wildwood site, you would most likely have underground chambers for retention and infiltration, which would not probably be the, the route we would go here. So there would be a cost difference between the sites in that way. Thank you. I'm just, I don't, I'm not seeing, uh, there's, Mike has his hand up. And so I just had a, a quick question. Uh, these are initial diagrams, so I, I want to be conscious of that. Um, but the parking with the loop looks different at Fort River than it did at Wildwood in terms of splitting out sort of an access road and how that works. Is that more a function of site dynamics or is it a function of these are very initial drafts um, or a little bit of both? Um, it's a little bit of both. Um, there are key considerations that we always like to, you know, um, guide the design for the site. And sometimes they are in conflict with each other, but we like to keep bus traffic, parent drop off traffic separate from each other. We like to keep them separate from active parking. We like to keep parking 
uh, for lots of reasons, as close to the building as possible, just for convenience. Um, and then when you have all of this, you know, things happening across purposes, sometimes the, the paths get a little convoluted. And I, I think there's a lot of work to be here. Yes, I, we have to say these are very initial diagrams. Um, but, you know, you see some, you know, obviously the, the extra loops are to provide queuing and drop off distance that will make traffic flow a little bit better and keep it off of the street where we know we're next to busy ex intersections and we don't want things to back up because that's uh, problematic. Thank you, Tim. That's really so, helpful. I appreciate the explanation. So Tim, just, just to add to that too, um, even though these are so preliminary, as we are looking at how they sit on the site and also the respond to Paul, we, we are looking at preliminarily where it makes sense to have the main entry, how the building might relate to outdoor spaces. Um, if, we, if we plan on the larger spaces in certain areas, such as the, such as the cafeteria, how does that relate to the playground? So, so even though these are so preliminary and they're just shown as a white outline on the plan, they, there's some logic to it and as we continue the design process, it, it is gonna be a series of pushing and pulling, especially as we gather more information um, below grade on, on each site. Yeah, I mean, and some of the opportunities of this site actually make it hard. You, you actually want there to be a back door. You want there to be a loading dock separate from everything else. I mean, it's one of the great things about this site is you have a terrific site in every direction. I mean, it's almost hard to locate the loading dock. So that's the sort of uh, sort of issues that we're working with. And, and again, just to add to the entire conversation, we will want to work with your public safety officials and understand a lot of communities want full access for emergency use around the building. And how does that play in? Um, so, so again, you know, we want to hurry up and get there, but at the same time, there's so much fact finding and understanding. So it will be interesting to see how this all plays out. These are our initial thoughts based on information that we've gathered over the years and working with many districts, um, taking into consideration we haven't even received the full report back from our traffic consultants, right? So, and we just we, we, we're just recently learning how many parking spaces are required. So uh, it'll be interesting to see how the, what the final solution is on, on either site. Absolutely. And just to clarify, I, I, I know this is very initial. I just wanted to, to point it out because I know it's an interest of, of mine and, and principles around the logistical operational end. So that wasn't at all to push you all. I just wanted to ask the question to get the conversation started. And I uh, really appreciate the answers. And, and certainly I know uh, our public health folks, uh, our public safety folks would be more than happy to, to meet and to offer their two cents and some of the points that you raised. So yeah, appreciate uh, the thoughtfulness you're putting into it. Yeah, and, and um, you know, sometimes just like anything, um, putting something out there, it, <laughs> it has to work regardless whether whether it's the final option or or the first thought, right? So, um, but but it will it. This is where hopefully uh, once we get get past PDP and um, PSR, you know this this will really start shaping. This is when the fun part starts. So, and I think Tim, you had a couple of others as it related to. Yeah, we're just going to show the same factors at play as it relates to um, renovation addition. Uh, here we are on Fort River. Um, I mean, it's just a diagram, but uh, conceptually, you can think about it as saving the classrooms in the existing building, creating uh, a courtyard in the middle uh, that would allow daylight into all of the classrooms uh, in, a, in a much better way than it happens now. And then the addition would hold all of the uh, some classrooms, but uh, a majority of the core spaces for the building. Um, you know, this, this, since you're occupying the location of the existing building, it frees up more of the site to the south. So we've moved some things around that take up some space, uh, like the geothermal field. Um, and then, you know, this essentially adopts the same site circulation that works with the existing building 
but you have a little bit more um, space for uh, recreation and community use to the south. Uh, but this option clearly either requires um, some fairly complicated phasing or a uh, swing space for the entire school. Um, so it's just to illustrate that as we go through the at reno options, you know, the same factors will be at play. And, and then in, just to bring it back, uh, since this is the existing building and we're adding to it, there's a good chance that you might be adding to the impervious area of the site. So the uh, stormwater requirements might actually be a little bit higher for this option than for a new building. So um, we have to keep all of that in the back of our mind as we evaluate these options. And then here's a similar renovation scheme on the Wildwood site. Um, with the tighter site, the phasing, construction logistics, all of that becomes all the more important. Uh, but if you can get that to work, there actually is space in a less congested area of the site for the geothermal field, um, where it was shown on the new building option is close to the access road where all of the utilities come in for the existing building, the Head Start actually for the middle school down the road. So there are some complications, the geothermal field to the west of the site. So just another illustration of the things that we have to think about as we're moving forward. Uh, Kathy, sorry, I didn't see your hand. No, that's okay. It's, it's a question that's either picture um, on the part that so th this is, I understood it is to do this would be take you longer because you have to phase it. Um, that's a question. And then the part that's white that you're keeping, um, since it doesn't look anything like the current building, you're knocking out a core and then doing, is, that's all one story? Um, that that is, is all one story. It would be a gut renovation. It would essentially be uh, saving the perimeter wall in the classroom shell, but it would be basically unrecognizable uh, in a good way uh, when you entered it in its final condition. And then um, on the floor, the floor that's underneath the white and the roof that's on top of the white, do those ha all have to go um, for putting in the new heating and ventilation systems? Uh, so the, the structure would probably remain. There would be cutting into the slab if we we're moving plumbing around. Um, uh, heating, uh, mechanical piping, and ductwork would probably be hung from the existing structure. Uh, we would most likely re-roof the building. Uh, other than the structure itself, uh, just about everything would go or be touched in some way, uh, probably including the envelope, uh, the walls of the building. Jonathan has his hand up. A little bit into the weeds and, and a little bit of a head, but but maybe not quite so much. Um, I, I would want us. I would encourage us to consider uh, replacing the slabs in the classrooms in in any ad reno uh, versions. There there's no vapor barriers under the current slabs, and that has led to uh, issues with condensation and mold uh, uh, in historically in some of the schools. Uh, I, I think, you know, that makes a lot of sense when we would look at it. I mean, it just from the amount of plumbing rework that we would have to do, it, it might, you know, be obvious that that's the reason, even if it wasn't just for a paper, but absolutely. Um, but uh, if, Tim, another successful thing is what we were doing before adhesives for resilient flooring uh, got to be much better of late was a, a moisture mitigation system that we used to be putting down over slabs uh, in order to stick the new floor down would also keep vapor pressure uh, from the ground from coming up. So that's, that's a, a solution also if we're not pulling up that much of the slab, but by putting a vapor mitigation uh, system down over the entire slab, it could lock out that moisture. Thank you. I'm not, I'm not seeing any other hands up. Um, those are the options that we have for today. As we get into the next meeting, we'll have uh, a full complement of options that will be priced and 
evaluated and eventually for you to decide on. Um, but this was just to give you a flavor of, you know, how the pieces are moving in our continuing understanding how it's developing of all of the big pieces, the parking, the traffic, building size, you name it. Yeah, and, and just to add to that, um, as, as far as the preliminary design program is concerned, you know, it, the basis of design is probably going to be more important because we don't have anything really truly designed yet um, when we're obtaining costing. And as part of the MSBA process and, and the interest in the community, we'll continue to vet and explore both the renovation addition and new construction options fully to make sure that we have the most cost efficient um, shortest duration of construction for each of the options, uh, recognizing that a reno ad is just going to have to be phased because we have no swing space for the students. But all of that will be vetted once we have the program needs and the hierarchy of what goes where from a spatial relation adjacency perspective um, once we get through the PDP. So again, as Tim said, uh, this in no means has been flushed out, but we actually were pretty excited when we saw this reno ad option because it will transform the building and uh, create actual walls and proper teaching spaces for the students while preserving a good portion of the building. So I'm, I think I'm not seeing it. Yeah, Phoebe, 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 sorry. Oh, Phoebe. Okay, sorry, Phoebe, your hand is up on your door and I didn't see it. <laughs> so. No, you're, oh yeah, I know, sorry. <laughs> um, so I, I'm, so the school committee, <clears throat> excuse me, is going to theoretically vote on the educational program and the square footage stuff um, according to the, to today's agenda on the 8th. Am I correct about that? Correct. Okay, and then we are, we are scheduled to then um, on the 11th meet and review the um, sort of quote unquote final design stuff. I, and I put final cause it's, it says it in there but I can't imagine it can be final. Um, yes, correct. So it, what, what I don't, yeah, there's nothing final right now other right. than what the educational <laughs> program will be. Absolutely. Right. We haven't even, but, but so, right. So the preliminary design program is the first step. We submit what the educational program is the space summary that supports the educational program. We submit it to MSBA as well as they call them alternatives. They don't, they don't even call them options or concepts. They call them alternatives right now. And we will be required to look at 165 student school, what a baseline repair only is, mm -hmm. what a renovation addition would look like or cost. I can't even say what would look like. We don't even show MSBA the level of detail here. It's, it's all costs per square foot based on certain parameters. Um, and a new construction. MSBA will quickly recognize and agree with this with the town that we really don't need to continue to explore those options any further. However, they're going to ask us to carry that cost, that order of magnitude cost per square foot going forward through uh, preferred schematic report. In addition to the 165, which is kind of background noise at this point, um, we have to do the same for renovation addition and new construction for the 575. So okay. we'll continue to carry those forward unless for some crazy reason, something's discovered between now and March that one site doesn't work. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we understand that both sites are still viable and they both have different attributes that we will continue to explore between March and June, what the options are for renovation addition and new construction at both sites. So I, I think what I'm I think what I'm trying to, to figure out is if if the school committee is focused on 
how we're using the square footage, what it's going to be, all of those kinds of things. We keep looking at these um, diagrams. They're diagrams. Oh, I think Wait, she froze. Did we lose your baby? I think yeah, just froze. she froze. I uh, don't know what to do. Oh, there oh. she is. Am I there back? Yeah. Oh, geez. Um, so basically, if we continue to be looking at these diagrams, what are we supposed to be looking for? Because we, we don't have square footage, so we can't really look at what it's going to look at and look like those kinds of things. What are we supposed to be looking at these with the intent of? Uh, there really isn't, uh, Phoebe, and thank you. And, you know, the hard, the, the challenge with the process is that technically it's linear, right? Your ed program, you're this, you're this, you gain all, you, you look at all of your constraints, you understand the parking needs, you understand hours of operation, but, but really everything, we can't wait three months or four months to start the design conversation. So we, we have to try to get ahead of it a little bit to start understanding how this might all fit on, on both sites and, and just start the conversation. So what we're saying is, as we've preliminary vetted both, both sites and a renovation addition new construction at both sites, that both sites and both options are worthy for further consideration. And so I think really right now, that's the best that we can say, but what we want you to see is how we think through and how you all are going to be thinking through as we start putting together true options and all of the requirements that are going to go into the thought process. So we're not asking anyone to really look at anything in detail right now. It's more of, is there any option or alternative that we do not want to continue to explore? Because the the PDP says, here are all of the options we've looked at, and we want to continue to evaluate X, Y, Z. We, we, we looked at A through Z, and now we only want to look at X, Y, Z. And what we're saying, and what we've heard from the town, is that both sites are still viable, and a renovation addition, new construction are still viable on both sites. So those are going to be what we'll be exploring and bringing to you um, over the next three months. Does, does that help? Okay. Um, I'm just gonna, so I just wanted to ask, because I think I understood from earlier, when you come back to us on the 4th with the probable cost estimates that you're gonna be breaking out or being able to show us the cost of what, of the geothermal. Um, so we'll be able to see that either as, incorporated in the building, but you, you can give us a sense because you've said we need this many wells, that many wells, um, and, and or PV. Um, so I'm just, so to me, part of what, uh, Phoebe, I'm trying to figure out the same thing, you know, what part of what we're going to be seeing is we've said net zero and Jonathan will give a report and, and we have a way to get there that's an efficient heating system and air system but upfront costs are expensive. So that's one of the things we'll be seeing. We don't have to decide on it right now. Is that correct? You know, so we just have to know that's a factor in the side-by-side -side cost co comparisons. Um, correct. Yeah, so, so again, um, we really haven't drawn anything and we have explored the sites. So we believe we, have a good understanding at, at this phase, what is there and the attributes that will inform some of the conversation around cost as, as Tim mentioned, whether the foundations um, need to be special foundations or how the site may impact geothermal, all of that. But these are order of magnitude costs. Um, it's, it's always challenging to put out numbers when we don't really have pen to paper yet but it's part of the process. And so we will try to break out the cost, Kathy, as, as best as we can. Um, you know, another consideration is we can even show you what a CM construction method might be and a design bid build method 
might be, right? But these are order of magnitude costs and their ranges. And this is not committing the town to anything. This is really solely so that folks can understand the order of magnitude with the different options. And even at PSR, when we say, here's our preferred solution. So we get to pick one in June. Here's our preferred solution to move forward. Again, you're gonna have a more realist, I wouldn't say realistic, uh, assured cost, but it's not the final cost. So only at the end of schematic design, which we'll be presenting at the end of the year, will the town under, will all understand what the actual cost of construction and project will be. So again, until then, we're gonna refine it and get better because we'll have more information and we'll have a design or a concept. Um, but, and they'll still be not costs that, that we're hanging our hat on. I mean, we usually are really pretty good about estimating it, but we don't even have a design yet, right? So at the end of schematic design, we'll say, yep, we are this, unless something radically changes, here's gonna be the cost of the project and the cost to the town. And I know Margaret's gonna chime in. Margaret. Phoebe, the super short answer is, um, I think what your role here right now is just to follow the logic of how Danisco is thinking about it. And, you know, people are on the committee are asking questions. How did you think about that? How did you, that is your role right now. So they're in the lead and you're sort of following along so that where they land with options, you, you all as a group are develop, developing a common understanding of how to think about it. That's, that's the task. So I think um, I'm not seeing any other hands um, on this. And uh, so I think we could take the presentation down and then Tim, if you can make sure to send it to me afterwards so I can post this version. I didn't post the one that was missing some pieces. Um, we have the next on the agenda and I think it can be pretty quick as Jonathan was going to give um, a verbal report on what we've done so far in the subcommittee on net zero and Jonathan, so you, you're on. Um, you know, similar to where we are in the project overall, we're at very early stages. Um, Donna and, and her subconsultant team um, presented to the subcommittee and we've had, you know, a good bit of interest in the, in the you know, broader uh, community as well in, in our conversations. But they presented to us a um, target EUI, an energy use intensity, um, which is sort of a metric for, you um, uh, kind of judging the the building, and I'll you know Tim or, or Donna can chime in if I if I stray too much here, um, but but this target allows them and and their subconsultants uh, to work um, towards a target, um, and while we could choose to be more aggressive on that target, there's also a cost to this, and so they have they have, what they presented to us is what they feel like is is a balanced target. There are multiple ways to get to net zero um, and multiple, um, you know, within a range of, of EUIs. And the, the one they've targeted, one they've suggested to us as a target is 25. You could go lower and in the scale is, is more energy efficient. You could go lower to 19 or 20, um, but those may come with, with, with uh, cost uh, impacts that are different than targeting it at 25. Um, and as things go forward, we'll be looking at more detailed uh, um, proposals from them about you know, the amount of uh, uh, geothermal wells versus the number of um, uh, PV units we might have on the roof for over parking, uh, you know, what the actual energy performance of individual building elements like the roof or the walls will be. Um, is, that, is that too high level, Kathy? No, I, I think that I think that works, and 
Um, we we have posted the um, cons the design teams consultants that are experts on this have given us some terrific charts and I just want to make sure everyone knows that we are posting all the materials and so if you go on the town website for the elementary school building committee um, there is a set uh, the subcommittee is sitting there with the presentation material. So it talks about um, how the energy of the efficiency of the building relates to how thick the walls are, how good the envelope is, what the systems are that are in it, and then ultimately the PVs. And I, as a person who doesn't know anything about it, I found the charts really useful. I mean, they, they helped me understand that. We are not really going to meet again until the NISCO says it's time for the next meeting, but that would be in some time in March when they know enough more to bring the group back together again. Um, so I think that's it, but um, all the materials are up. Uh, Rupert, Rupert is on the subcommittee, and I know you have been starting to do exploration for us too on all of these. Yeah, I just uh, like to point out that. Um... Uh, ben Harrington and I met with Simone U, uh, Simon O, sorry, uh, and uh, members of the UNESCO team to talk about some of the technology involved uh, and operational complexities with heating and ventilation and air conditioning. And th that was very helpful and very useful to learn about some of the um, evolution of some of those technologies. Um, and I just wanted to, to thank the UNESCO for uh, setting that up and I hope the conversation continues. You know, Rupert, uh, Mike told me that you've also been talking to you, I think UMass, about their experience with geothermal once they've had it for a while. So I think the conversations you've been having, you should be sh sharing whatever way is best. But, uh, um, you know, what does this look like five years out or however long they've had them? And I know you, Amherst College has also had geothermal experience. So... Uh, sure, I'd be happy. I um, Mostly what I was sharing with Mike was my recollections uh, from my time at UMass, and I think it might be worth, uh, worth it if I got in touch with uh, my contacts there to see what the latest is, then I'd be happy to share that. Okay. So if there, I'm looking for if there are any questions on this. Otherwise, I think the next item, Sean, is invoices. And we're, we, we as a committee are approving the OPM invoices. There's another process that's working with the DENISCO invoices. So so we have a, um, a DENISCO invoice too to approve. Okay. Um, do we want to do both, I assume? That, that's fine. I mean, you're... Let me pull you're, up the. Um, you're, you're certainly in charge of this piece of it. <laughs> let me pull up the um, OPM invoice first. I can pull them up, Sean, if that's helpful. You, I have yeah, if up. you have them handy, that's probably easier. Yep, I do. Thank you. So you want to do the answer one first or the distance? Yeah, I want to do answer. That one's similar to what we've been doing. Okay. And um, I sent out this morning um, a little bit of context information for this. Um, if anyone has had a chance to look at it, here we go. Okay, so this is um, the answer invoice. Um, the total for this month is uh, 11,55750. And, you know, as always, there's uh, detail behind it that, ex you know, provides our time on an hourly basis. So. Kathy, it may be also worth me um noting for the committee um, that the council did approve um, an increase in the feasibility study budget. Um, and maybe at the next meeting, we can go over that in more detail, but um, that was related to the design contract and some of the, um, some of the sub consultants that we'll need to finish out the feasibility study. Do I? I'm, so I, I move to I move to approve. It's a two two comments. One comment, um, Kathy, is that this meeting must end at ten thirty because this account has another meeting starting at ten thirty. Just so. Yeah. So so, so we'll, we'll move it as quickly as we can. Yeah. And you've oh. got public comment too. So I approve. I move to approve this invoice. And I second. And then I think I need to. 
um, well, we have the two invoices, so I, I need to take a roll call vote on each invoice. Um, so uh, I need uh, to call. Um, I will call the members. Um, Jonathan. Yes. Mike. Yes. Paul. Yes. John. Yes. Phoebe. Yes. Rupert. Yes. Alicia. Yes. And I'm not seeing, I know Ben was here, but I'm not seeing him. So I think that is. Ben is here. Okay, Ben. Yes. Okay, there's Ben. Sorry, Ben. So I, I think I got everyone. That was unanimous. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> One viewer screen. Um, and did I, did I get Simone as well? Yes. Okay, thank you. So then, Sean, we need to do the Danisco ones as well? Yeah, so Margaret will bring this one up. So this is the first invoice for Danisco and the process that um, Margaret and I worked out is that she's gonna review these first um, and just make sure everything looks good and consistent with what we need from SBA and then she'll code it and send it over to me to, uh, for approval. So this is an invoice for um, the invoice itself is the last page, but the summary is helpful. So the Danisco invoice is billed on a lump sum basis. So it doesn't have all the detail of the other, but they're billing um, this month 16.67%, um, um, which is a total of 33,333. So I, do I hear a move to approve? I'll move to approve. Second. And then I will do a roll call vote again. So Paul? Yes. Kathy is a yes. Sean? Yes. Tammy? Yes. Rupert? Yes. Ben? Yes. Mike? Yes. Allison? Yes. Phoebe? Yes. Jonathan? Yes. Simone? Yes. And Alicia? Yes. And um, so I think we've done that. Um, if I don't hear any other comments, as Paul said, we're going to have to end this. So I want to make sure we allow for public comments. So I think we're open uh, for public comments. And I see a hand is up. Paul, are you going to be able to say, or should I start managing this? You can manage it. OK, so we brought Jennifer, we brought you in um, for comments. Jennifer. Hi there, Jennifer Shaw, a member of the Amherst School Committee. Um, I, I'm not sure the school committee members are aware that it's our job to go over the detailed space summary at our next meeting. I know we had planned to go over it at the next meeting. I'm not sure the school committee members were aware that it was our job to approve it. I had been under the impression that our job was to approve the 34 page educational program not the detailed spreadsheet with the um, space summary. So I know that now because I took the time to attend this meeting, but I'm hoping we can maybe just make sure that the rest of the school committee members are aware that that's what's going to be coming up at our Tuesday meeting. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Um, there is uh, another, I think there was another hand up, Paul. Three, there are three. Okay. Rudy Perkins. Rudy, you are joined us. You hey, thank you. Um, I am so glad to hear that you're the Danisco and the school department folks and the school superintendent are looking at reducing the square footage because uh, I was very concerned about the original gross estimate, uh, gross square foot estimate. It looked like we were planning to build a school that was about 91, 92% of the prior Wildwood plan with only 77% of the student population. So something seemed out of kilter there. And obviously that has a huge impact on construction costs and soft costs. And then on the, the amount of solar and geothermal we will have to build and fund um, if we go to a building that's too large. So I really approve and appreciate your uh, seriously scrutinizing the space and trying to get that down. 
We should be frugal, not miserly, but frugal with our space, just the way we will be with energy. Um, and uh, I wanted to, and obviously there's an embodied carbon cost of going to with bigger buildings and all that. So from a climate standpoint, this is better, not just uh, from a cost, dollar cost standpoint. Um, I did want to ask, uh, as you look at the two-story versus three-story, and I see there's pros and cons with both approaches, is will you be looking at the fact you might have more room on a two-story to put solar panel and that that might be able to avoid some or all of the canopy over the parking lot solar? And will you look at the cost impact of canopy over parking lot versus rooftop? And will that factor in into the options for going with two stories versus three? You obviously get more roof area on a two-story building for your energy load than you do with a three-story building, more room for solar panels. So, um, so will you be looking at that? Thanks. Rudy, I'm gonna take that as a comment, um, but we're not gonna respond right now. So I think that is put into the bigger questions. Um, tone, uh, so I'm seeing, are you bringing in Chris, Tony's, Tony is in. Tony, you've joined us. You can unmute. Tony, you're muted right now. Oh, sorry. When I got added as a panelist, it kicked me out temporarily. So I missed whatever was last said. Um, so I just wanted to, uh, hark back to what uh, Jennifer Shaw just said. I think there's some confusion on the roles and responsibilities still between the school committee and the building committee around the space summary. Um, I watched the school committee meeting, the last one, and the space summary, that uh, slide that collapsed the categories, the core academic and special education and so on was presented, but the detail was not. And although it was in the meeting packet, it was not discussed and it was not presented. And I'm concerned that there won't be a scrutiny of each line item um, to the degree that really is needed at this point. Uh, I would, I'm totally excited about this school. I want everybody to be able to support it. I want an override to pass with 75 or 80%. And I want us to be a net zero school and not sacrifice any of the net zero for for more square footage and and so i really want to urge I, I was hoping today the building committee would go through the space summary line by line the full spreadsheet so it was disappointing that again we saw the collapsed um slide the summary slide so i'm just concerned that the school committee is not going to do this work um and doesn't think it's their responsibility and and then it's it'll be back to the building committee to vote to approve this and submit it in the PDP. So I don't know what the answer is because your next meeting's not for two more weeks. Um, maybe you could add another meeting and, and go through the summary yourselves as well after the school committee meeting. Um, so it's, it's more just an observation and a comment and a, and a concern. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. Um, and we have one more, Chris Riddle. We bring, hi, Chris. Chris, you've joined us. You need to unmute. Uh, Chris Riddle from Strong Street, very close to Wildwood. Um, I wanna add my uh, voice to Rudy's about the, the, the necessity to be parsimonious in, our, uh, in, uh, in the tabulation of the number of square feet because it's so linearly connected to the cost. Just worried about, um, the sticker shock that the town will, uh, that maybe may characterize the town's reaction to this. We do have to get an override. Um, so it's, it's really, it's work hard to try to uh, fine tune the, those numbers. Uh, a couple of questions. Um, do you do, and for and Fort River, do you anticipate recharging the site uh, to make the soil ca uh, bearing capacity bigger? Um, what is the hillside Northeast of the Wildwood School that shows us an out parcel? Uh, who owns that? Because can that with having that uh, um, piece of land available to us, how would that help? Um, uh, what happens to the playground and the and the toilet building at Fort River? And um, it was built by a lot of volunteer work many years ago. Um, uh, can you put geothermal under parking? And can you put geothermal under playing fields? 
And lastly, um, I, uh, it's important to instant, not just to uh, put a vapor barrier underneath the slab at Fort River, but to um, put insulation there also. It's a, it's a big heat loss there. Those are my questions. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Chris. And we will be just, I want to assure everyone from the public, we will be um, capturing the questions, but not responding now. Um, it looks, is there one more, Paul? Yes. Okay. Maria is in the room. Maria Kapicki, live in South Amherst. Um, I share a lot of the concerns that I'm hearing here about the size of the building. The size of the building, as, as people have pointed out, impacts not only dollar costs, but uh, climate impacts. Every square foot that you have is going to have to be heated, cooled, maintained. Um, and there's going to be embodied carbon that has to go into building it. So when we talk about and when we emphasize the need to get this building to be as efficient as possible, that also means space efficiency, as we've spoken about. When whoever is going to be going through this and I hope it is line by line, and I hope it is publicly done, and I hope that those documents are available to both committee members and to the public well before the meetings occur. I think we need to be thinking about all the space in the building and are we using all of that space throughout the, the week and throughout the year in a way that maximizes that efficiency? Are there spaces that can be shared by a number of different groups and for a number of different uses? Um, that's what I think we need to be thinking about. I don't hear here or in other places any calls to decrease programming and to serve the needs of the students. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about trying to get to a place where we can do the right thing for our kids and for the climate and for our kids that are gonna to have to deal with the climate into the future. And also that everybody in town can afford. I'm also concerned about the lack of cost estimates. Uh, frankly, to say that we're talking order of magnitude is, uh, I think, a little disingenuous. Order of magnitude is a factor of 10. Um, I think that the MSBA site provides a great deal of data of cost estimates for buildings of comparable size throughout time. There is a lot of information out there. We're not talking about the difference between $100 per square foot and $1,000 per square foot. I think it's quite reasonable to have some estimates. And I think that those are gonna be within a couple hundred square feet of each other. So we need to start talking about this. We have to end up with a building that can succeed. And I don't want us to reach for the sky and fall. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. Um, I think um, I'm trying to, we, we are right at the ending point, probably a few minutes over it. Um, so I want to thank Danisco um, and the team, the, the entire team. I, I know how hard you've been working on this in an incredibly short amount of time. And um, I want to thank all the committee members from coming here and, uh, and participating. So with that, we're gonna end the meeting. Also, if anyone has any, where are we, who are the roles, Margaret is more than happy to meet one-on-one -on -one with you to just go through because it's a complicated process. And uh, we're probably certainly moving faster than I would have imagined given that what we did in the fall, but we need to, to keep this moving. And it's, as it's pretty exciting to start seeing a possible building. So I think with that, I'm just going to adjourn the meeting. We will post the slides. 
we will, the minutes will capture the public comments and the design team heard them. Thank you very much, everyone.